What is your reaction as you hear this coming out of Vladimir Putin in Russia, and, uh, the, the, the not ruling out first strike of nuclear weapons? Well, his talk reflects uh, his weakness. Uh, he is losing badly uh, on the battlefield. If you look at what is taking place in Ukraine, his forces have been poorly trained, poorly led, poorly equipped, and they're being put into a meat grinder. So he is losing, and he knows he is losing. So now he's uh, upping the game, so to speak, by saying, well, I might uh, consider using nuclear weapons. Uh, that's very dangerous talk. Uh, I have talked to a number of different countries, and they feel the same way. This would be a, uh, a bridge way too far for him to take and talk of, well, a limited, small nuclear weapon. Once a nuclear weapon is used, I think the world community will come down hard on him uh, and, and his country. So it's talk to say, I still have power. I have oil, gas, and guns. I'm prepared to use the biggest gun of all, but I think that it's more of a, a threat, not necessarily empty, but a threat at this point to show how, quote, strong he is when he, in fact, is weak. Mr. Secretary, back at the height of the Cold War, when it was the Soviet Union, not Russia, but the Soviet Union the United States, there's a lot of talk about mutual assured destruction. That made One of the things that kept us safer, we thought, was the fact that both sides knew the other one would really retaliate massively. Are we confident that we've conveyed to Vladimir Putin and the, and the Kremlin exactly what the sort of reaction from the West might be if he used even low-yield nuclear weapons? Well, we have a triad, and you know, the talk about I might use a first strike weapon uh, and hit the United States or one of our allies uh, peremptorily, well, we have a triad. It would be very hard for him uh, to take out our uh, response capability. We have always, I think, operated on the basis that uh, we don't want to be the first to use it to set off a tripwire that on suddenly thousands of nuclear weapons are unleashed, and then we have the consequence of having a nuclear winter as such where the Earth itself is in danger. So I, I think we have the capability. He knows it. That's what's kept both of us at bay. Uh, China adds a new dimension to that because they are developing uh, nuclear weapons very rapidly. Uh, they have shown no interest in talking about how to uh, either control or reduce those weapons. Iran is trying to get one. North Korea has some. And so the world has become a much more dangerous place because more countries now have the capability and they're not always rational or responsible uh, or uh, have the, uh, the wisdom to withhold any thought of using a nuclear weapon. Mr. Secretary, to what extent are you concerned about these attacks in inside of Russia uh, by drones, uh, presumably from Ukrainians, I don't think they've confirmed it is, but of Russian military bases, I would say, not civilian targets. But do, does that really provoke Vladimir Putin to a degree that maybe we don't want? Oh, I'm assuming it will provoke him. Uh, he has been on the offense destroying much of Ukraine. Uh, he is using um, oil and uh, the weather. Uh, to weaponize both of them and trying to starve out and freeze out the Ukrainian people. So now they're striking back, saying that uh, we have a capacity to reach you as well. I assume that that is going to provoke a response from him. But, you know, the Ukrainians have been uh, absorbing all of that um, uh, weaponry, uh, hitting them day after day, 100 missiles a day, uh, hitting their infrastructure, killing innocent people. So saying to Putin, you're not off limits here. You know, we have a capacity now, thanks to the West, that we can strike you as well. So uh, I don't know how he'll receive that. If he ups uh, the, uh, the attacks again, I think he's going to find the Ukrainians are going to do even more. So at some point in time, there'll be a resolution, but neither party is willing to, to talk about that. So I think what we have to do is continue to support Ukraine. I think they have to continue to kill or capture um, as many Russian soldiers as possible. So whatever popularity Putin has gained as a result of this exchange of uh, Brittany uh, and um, and not getting by Paul William. Any, any uh, gain that he has received in terms of that being a popular measure for him, it's going to be short-lived because more and more Russian soldiers are coming home in boxes. And so that's going to be very demoralizing uh, to the Russian people. Just what I'd like to hear from you on that, Brittany Griner. Uh, this is day two. As I understand it, she's on the ground now, safe and sound, back in Texas. As you say, Paul Whalen, the former Marine, is still over there in prison. Uh, you must have been exposed to some of these sorts of situations when you were in the government. And I guess my basic question is, how do you strike the balance? On the one hand, obviously, you want to get that woman back. You don't want her to serve in a penal colony for nine months, for nine years for what she did. Uh, at the same time, does this encourage either Vladimir Putin or other people around the world to say, let's go uh, snatch an American citizen or two because we might be able to use them? 
Well, that's always been the, the danger. Whenever we are forward deployed in any country uh, in the world, you could have radical groups seizing one of the Americans and either torture them or try to use them as some sort of a bargaining tool. So that's something that uh, has been out there, will probably be out there in the future. Uh, but in terms of uh, this exchange, I want to take some, number one, congratulate the Biden administration for getting Brittany back. Number two, to congratulate the Whelan family, because they really have tried to take the politics out of this by saying uh, that uh, I wish we could have gotten our brother uh, back, uh, but it, it was better that we got uh, Brittany out if that was the only deal possible. The tougher part would have been if Putin had said, you get one back, you pick which one you're going to get back. That would have been a tougher situation, but as I understand it, it was simply you only get uh, Brittany back. Uh, uh, you will not uh, get Paul uh, Whalen out of here. So I, I think the Whalen family said we don't. We're not happy. We are uh, disappointed, but we understand and we support what the Biden administration did. And I think that should try to take the politics out of it. Where Republicans are saying, "Well, this really rewards Putin. He's stronger. He's not stronger. He's weak." And we ought to stop saying how strong he is and building Russia up. Russia is the enemy of freedom uh, and, and liberty for individuals. And we're seeing that play out. They just arrested uh, an associate of Malvi, and they put him in prison for eight and a half, nine years. For what? Because he was critical of the war in Ukraine. So that tells you what Russia is. It tells you how weak Putin is, that he can't afford to have anybody say, number one, it's a war, or number two, that um, they're, we're losing him. Uh, so that talks to me about weakness, not strength. Mr. Secretary, finally, let's uh, come back to Washington and Capitol Hill. As you know, there's the pending right now the National Defense Authorization Act, which we need to get going in order to keep our military going. Uh, what is your reaction to what's happening right now on Capitol Hill? I, as I understand, they've attached some things, haven't attached some other things. For example, I think they've done around with the va done away with the vaccine requirement. On the other hand, they've banned uh, purchase of semiconductors from China. What do we need for our military right now? Well, we need to uh, reindustrialize here. We've allowed our industrial base uh, to uh, to weaken, and we've seen that by being reliant upon so many other countries, including Taiwan, as a prime example for our uh, microchips. So we've got to reindustrialize here, reshore industries here to the best we can, uh, continue to do business with all of our allies uh, in order to keep us strong. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of the defense uh, authorization, I was really quite, well, surprised that they would uh, take out the mandate for vaccinations. I faced this uh, at the Pentagon when we had an anthrax scare, and I mandated that uh, men and women who are going to be uh, sent and deployed to an area where anthrax was a threat, we all should be vaccinated. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, myself, we lined up in front of the cameras and said, we're willing to take this vaccine to show you there's no consequence, uh, uh, ill-advised consequence uh, coming to you. But when you now say that it's no longer mandated, so you could have members, and most of them have been vaccinated, 90% plus have been vaccinated, but those 10% who have, haven't, if they were to go into, uh, into battle as such and then come down with COVID, what's that, what does that do to the mission? Hmm. We always have to be concerned about mission, the accomplishment of mission, and not compromising our fellow soldiers because of something that we could have done and we didn't do. So I think that that was a mistake, but uh, I think the, the military will have to uh, live with it if the Senate doesn't change it.